Well, good morning and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have our young adults back from the camping trip, hopefully mostly tick-free, so that's, uh, that's always good. So welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. And those of us who are joining, for those of you joining online, we want to say welcome as well. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we started off a series a few weeks back, and next week we're going to wrap it up. I'll share more about that at the end here. But uh, we wanted to maybe just recap what we talked about. So last week we talked about this idea about what does it mean to, to have the Holy Spirit, right? I said to you there was two images in, in mind that kind of come to us, right? So the first one is this battery, right? One of the misunderstandings we have of the Holy Spirit is that we think of the Holy Spirit, uh, we think of our lives as a battery. And like any batteries, we can a- access energy or power from that battery as we would want, unless the battery's dead. So, but the problem with that idea of the Holy Spirit is, is that when we pray, ask, or seek God, we don't often get the type of responses we want. So if we're praying for the miraculous, if we're asking for an intervention, whatever it might be, and if it doesn't happen, of course, then we turn inwards. We go, well, maybe it's me, maybe it's my sinfulness, or maybe there is no God, or, or, or again, the tangents are almost unending. But see, the problem with that understanding is not really a biblical understanding of how the Holy Spirit works. And I said to you that the way that I'd love you to to think about the Holy Spirit is you as a straw, right? And the idea behind the straw is that the straw is empty, right? Remember, a straw is an empty container that merely directs the contents when they are available. For any of you who have ever had a soft drink or a milkshake or anything like that, right? You could slurp all you want, but when you hit the bottom, you have that, that sound, that's a really gross sound to make as well, too. But you have that sound, and you're like, oh, it's, oh it, it's at the end. So what I want you to think about when you think about the Holy Spirit, when you think about the power of the Holy Spirit, is that you do not contain the power. You are not a battery. You are a straw, right? And remember, the straw needs two things, right? Well, contents need two things. One, something to direct it, and two, the availability of it. And when you have that understanding, what happens is it alleviates any kind of Uh, responsibility you have in regards to whatever your prayer is or or whatever you're seeking. Now, remember, I know that sometimes when we pray, we ask for something. There's there's no, it's not as if it's bad motivations. If you're praying for healing, salvation, uh, some sort of physical intervention, like these are not bad things. But what you have to keep in mind is that God doesn't do what we want. God is God. And he acts according to his will. And what we have is a small slice of reality that we see and understand, but God has all of it. So whatever he does, however he acts, however he intervenes, he, he does it according to his will and to his plan. We talked about the two things, about two ideas of the Holy Spirit, right? I said to you that the Holy Spirit is triggered by need. And I said to you, the greatest need is salvation. Apart from whatever humanity is suffering right now in the world today, and again, almost every time you turn on the news or look at your social media feeds, the world just, again, it just seems to be kind of, you know, circling the drain. I don't know how else to say it, right? It's just, it's just, it seems to be a mess, right? Whether it's injustice, whether it's poverty, whether it's violence, whether it's corrupt. Like, again, we just look around, and again, you know, to the south, we look as well, too. And again, like another shooting. We just, we just, we honestly, it's almost impossible to wrap your minds around some of the motivations of people that would enact such violence and harm towards us. Again, we don't, we just don't get it. But I said to you that apart from all of that, and again, that's, that's, that's no small statement, the greatest need that every human being has on the planet is first is salvation and authentic, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But the second thing I said about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit resists comfort, right? When we, what we really want out of our lives is we want the most amount of comfort, the maximum amount of comfort. And comfort looks like many things, right? Uh, relationships, finances, uh, academics, uh, career, uh, ma- you know, maybe people just looking at you as an whatever it might be, like as far as influencer or whatever. Like whatever that looks like to you, we say to ourselves, okay, that's fine, but really comfort resists the Holy Spirit. I could, you know, I was very tempted just to spend an entire morning talking to you about the miraculous that's been documented around the world. There's a fascinating book, and I, I apologize. I meant to reference it before I came, but there's a book that um, an anthropologist, a Christian anthropologist, and a psychologist in America wrote about um, a demonic activity. I, I know, wild, right? But they didn't approach it like, oh, the demons everywhere. But what they did is they, they, they found examples of it, and what they did is they researched. They went in, and they actually, and what was fascinating about it is some of the stories they tell. Now, the reason I say that to you is not 
A, to freak you out, or B, make you watch Paranormal again or something. But it's a, the simple point is, whenever I talk to people about the power of God, most people say to me, that doesn't happen. Or that's not happening today. I literally had a conversation uh, uh, this week with an individual who said one of the reasons why they left faith, why they left Christianity, is because they're no longer seeing this. So the Bible talks about the miraculous. We go, oh, okay. But when it doesn't happen, we get, we're left with the idea of like, well, you can, you can pray to your spaghetti monster in the sky, or you can pray to, you know, whoever it is in the sky, but that doesn't mean anything. It's just, that's your way of, you know, comforting yourself. So when we think about the Holy Spirit, when we think about the power of the Holy Spirit, one thing we need to understand is we, we need to make sure that we realize that the Holy Spirit is all about, um, is, is all about transformation, right? And we looked at the three metaphors, and these three metaphors help us to realize that one of the reasons why it's so difficult to define the function of the Holy Spirit is the Bible uses metaphors, right? And the three we looked at last week was oil, wind, and fire, right? And so what the reason we looked at that is because these are three metaphors that talk about how the Holy Spirit works and functions. And we wrapped up looking at Romans chapter 7. Now, remember I told you, Romans 7 is one of my favorite chapters in the book of Romans because this is the one chapter where Paul says something that I completely relate to. Why do I do what I don't want to do? Again, every Christ follower kind of goes, yes, right? Finally, I can agree with Paul and kind of, he relates to me, right? Why do I do what I don't want to do? The good that I want to do, I don't do. The bad that I don't want to do, I do. And we all kind of go, yeah, okay. But then Paul kind of goes through that. But what we don't realize is when we walk through this kind of passage, these, these verses, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, now there's now condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. But that's not where Paul lands on this. Where Paul lands is the Spirit. Right? Well, well, Paul's solution to the sin that is internal to us, the corruption that is internal to us, the urges, the impulses, the desires that are contrary to what God wants, Paul's solution isn't bear down, grind down, you know, bite down against get, get, get willpower. Right? Oftentimes when we talk about behavior modification in the church, it's willpower. But if you ever try to have any exercise or diet or change in how you spend money and all that, willpower does not work. Right? Willpower may work in the first week or so as far as the emotional experience of it, but willpower does not work after that. There has to be something more. And so Paul's solution comes from the Holy Spirit. So that's what we looked at last week. This week we're going to talk about kind of a, I, I don't think it's controversial, but I, I, my daughter texted me. She said, be gentle this morning. Um, and I, I, I think I'm very gentle uh, for the most part. But the question we want to ask this morning is, uh, is what is a Christian? Now, I also want to put on the screen uh, the text number. If you want to text in questions, and after today's sermon, you might, uh, just take a picture of that uh, because I will answer your questions at the end. Because, I again, I don't think I'm being controversial, but I say that, but then people say to me afterwards, wow, yeah, that was really controversial. I'm like, oh, okay, fair enough, right? So let's ask this question. What is a Christian? Right? What is a Christian? So let me give you some examples of some definitions that I found online. Right? So when we look at this idea of what, is, what does it mean to be a Christian, these are some examples right? So from some websites and some teachers. Right? So the first one I came from is, kind of, is a website called gotquestions.org. It's a Christian website. This, like I said, it answers questions that Christians have. So this is how they define a Christian. A true Christian is a person who has put faith and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, including his death on the cross as payment for sins and his resurrection on the third day. That seems like a pretty good def definition. Encyclopedia Britannica. One who professes belief in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Okay, a little, little shorter, but I, I get the intent. Uh, a guy named Dr. Michael Williams from Pathios.com says it this way. A Christian is someone who is saved, exhibits a changed life, who walks in faith, shares the gospel, and helps teach others how to live like Christ. I would say to you that those are, those are pretty good definitions of what it means to be a Christian. Right? Like, and if I was to say to you, what does it, be, what does it mean to be a Christian? You would, I, I would think for the most part, many of you would have something similar to that. Or, I don't know. Right? Like, again, there could be that definition as well, too. Uh, when we go to the Bible, when you look at theological uh, books, when it says, you know, when it kind of defines Christianity, one of the verses that pops up the most in regards to defining what a Christian is comes from the book of Romans again. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 10 says this, and I, I know you know this verse. It says this, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. 
And this would be, I'd say, Paul's way of defining what it means to be a Christian, right? The, and, and depending on your translation, it could say professing. So we, we, we confess or profess with our mouths, and we believe in our hearts. And I'd say to you, yeah. But believe it or not, Paul actually defines what a Christian is a couple of chapters before in a different way. And I just want to show it to you. So Romans chapter 8 says this. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, but then through your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Now, before I go on to the second part, I just want to highlight a couple of things there. A lot of ifs there. I think it's kind of interesting that Paul always kind of puts this precursor to what it is. He never makes an assumption. He never says, oh, no, you're a Christian because you attend church or your parents are Christians or that you went to Sunday school when you were a kid or that you, can, you made a confession of Christ when you were a teenager at camp or wherever it might be. It's always the if. I kind of like that because what Paul is trying to say here is I'm not making the assumption. Now look at the second part in verses 14 to 16. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought, you, uh, brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. See, one of the things that's interesting about salvation is, is that we have thought, or the Western church has, has kind of said, salvation is something that you own, right? This is something that I have. And when I grew up, salvation wasn't so I would go to hell. That was how I understood salvation. I want to be saved, so I, if I die, I don't go to hell. And again, I, I don't want to be a sociopath and want to go to hell, right? But if that's how you understand salvation, then what we'll do then and how I lived as a youth, I know this is a surprise to you because I'm so holy now, but all I try to do is I try to walk the line. How close to behaviors could I get without stepping over the line? When I stepped over the line, I do it quickly and I'd ask for forgiveness. Because all, right, all I'm trying to do is behavior modification. So again, I know this makes me old man here, and I am old-ish. Um, but the big controversy when I was a teenager was school dances. I know, right? Like you, some of you, like millennials and and Gen Z and uh, and Gen Y, you're like, what? Like what? Yeah, school dances. That was the thing, right? My youth pastor, bless his corrupted little soul, but he said something like this: like if you if you were at a school dance and Jesus returned, you would go to heaven with him. He said that stuff to us. And of course, what am I going to, like, he's a pastor. I'm like, oh, of course. So I just, I remember going to this one school dance. I think it was a Hawaiian theme because I remember wearing a lei. I don't know. That's, that, that image sticks out on me. So I remember going in, looking at my watch, and going to the school dance. And again, school dance is the most ridiculous thing because all they do is, especially in, in high schools, you, you know, the guys are on one side, the girls on the other, and the weirdos are dancing in the middle. That's, that's basically what a school dance is. That's as close as we get to a school dance. But one thing I did, though, as soon as I got out of the school dance, is I called my mom. Because in, in my mind, the most spiritual person I knew, the person who loved Jesus the most, was my mother. So if Jesus returned or the rapture took place or anything else took place, if she was still here, I'm good. <laughs> right? that, was, like, that, was, that, was my, that was my anchor into reality. So I get out of the dance, and I, I call my mom, and, and, you know, bless my mom's heart. She would never be angry that I'd call at 11, 11.30 at night. She's like because she wanted to make sure I was okay. I'm like, hey, mom, I'm, I'm kind of going from bowling. I didn't tell her I was going to dance. I'm not that stupid, right? And she's like, okay, fine. You got to ride home. Yeah, okay, good to see you. But she was there. So Jesus hadn't returned. I hadn't missed out a thing, and I'll repent on the way home, right? Now, I, I kind of jokingly say that to you, and we can all kind of chuckle and laugh and make fun of me secretly afterwards. But the point simply is, if that's how you understand salvation, if that's how you understand your Christian faith, all we do is just kind of walk up to the line, right? That's why a lot of the conversations around Christianity are about what can I do, what can I not do? It's just, it's just simply a negotiation of holiness. And so what we do is like, okay, I can't go this far. That, that, that's sinful. But what's funny to me, and what studies are showing us, what uh, you know, surveys are showing us, is the Christian church is becoming very, how do I say this? They're becoming very, unbiblical in regards to what it means to be a Christ follower. So over the last couple of years, no, no surprise, the, the church has kind of gone through this seismic shift, right? Whether it's politics, whether it's vaccines, whether it's, you know, lockdown, like all these kind of things. And again, you guys know my heart on this at UCC. 
we have tried to, as much as possible, be wise in our decisions, but also to have a good example to the world around us. Whether people agree with it or not, we've had a few people leave our church because they haven't agreed with how we've, we've done things. Again, I understand that. But what's interesting to me about that is what we're using now is peripherals to define Christianity as opposed to how the Bible defines Christianity. And I would say to you that those definitions we saw about a defining of a Christian, there was no mention of the Holy Spirit in any of them. Now look at uh, verses 14 to 16. Right, what, what Paul is saying here is so important about what it means to be a Christ follower is that ultimately what a Christ follower is, adoption. Right? It's, it's, it's a phrase that Paul uses quite a bit. In other words, we are now part of the family of God. Jesus does the same thing in John chapter 3 when he talks about what it means to be his follower. So John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus replied, I, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, it's funny. This morning, a really kind of interesting conversation uh, Patrick and Jessica walked in when I was having this conversation. Lady walked into the theater, and uh, she wanted the theater. Uh, I, I, like she kind of, you know how people walk in, kind of going, they look like. So I don't know if they're here for the church or here for the movie. So I'm like, hey, good morning. What can I, ha- what can I do for you? And she's like, is this a church? I'm like, yeah. She's here for church. Well, I'm actually here for a movie thing. I'm like, wow, that was a real bait and switch there. But I'm like, okay, here, here's the movie schedule. And then we started having a conversation. The first thing she said to me is, well, are you born again? Well, that's a minefield right there, right? So as I've taught you before, and as I'll also repeat to you, never say yes or no to these kind of questions. So I said to her, what does that mean to you? What, what would that mean to you? Right? And so then she tells me that, you know, she hasn't, hasn't been to church in, 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 I think she said like 15, 16 years, thereabouts, and she finally found God. I'm like, oh, okay, fair enough. And I don't know if she's trying to bait me to have a debate with her and all that. I've had, I don't roll that way, as surprising as you might think that might be. But uh, I was like, oh, okay, fair enough, right? Like, like that's, how you, that's how you approach it. Now, the point simply is, is that when we look at this, this idea of what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, oftentimes the conversations are about our definition of what we want, we, what we accept, what we don't accept. But it's not really about what the Bible actually says. Now, look at verse 5 to 6 of this. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can produce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. I've said this before, and I'll say this again. Whatever Christianity is supposed to be, it is supposed to be, at its core, a supernatural event. Like, like I know that sounds kind of weird, and it gets a little spooky. And during the Holy Spirit series, I get a little bit spooky. I don't know what happened there. I'll let you guys take care of that. Um, but, oh, look at that. So, like, like, but the thing is, though, Christianity, and I use the word spooky, not in Casper the Friendly Ghost or, you know, any other kind of weird stuff. But there is this mystical aspect of it that Western empiricism really resists. And I understand it. Uh, there's, there was a mentor in my life. Uh, I say was just because he, he moved away and it's been a while since we had a, had a conversation. But he was he was my Christian mystic, right? Because we, we'd always have a conversation or whenever we'd have a mentoring conversation, he'd always say something like this. So what's God saying to you right now? It always used to freak me out because I was trying to like, I'm, I'm trying to make something up on the spot. Like, I'm like uh, uh, he, God says he likes me or he likes my shoes or I, I, I don't know, right? But when I would say that to him, what does God say to you? Well, that's it. For the next half hour, God would reveal this and all that. And I would just sit there going, wow, I wish I could have that kind of relationship where, where, that, where that, would, that would happen, right? But whatever we think about Christianity, it is, it is really a supernatural event. First John, again, John's gospel and John's letters really capture this essence of what Jesus is. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us, that he has given us the spirit. So, that's what a definition of a Christian would be. And I would say, whatever your definition of a Christian is, if it doesn't have an aspect of the Holy Spirit, I would say it is incomplete. Now, let's say, what's the definition of a church? This is also an interesting one as well, too. So we are part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. My background was PAOC, Pentecost Assemblies of Canada. But I've also worked in the Baptist church. And, you know, I've had, uh, I, I speak at Free Methodist Camp. So I'm basically like a Christian buffet, right? I, I see kind of all different things. And again, Catholicism, my, my mentors and Anglican priests, like I am all over the place, right? But what's interesting is I kind of hop from these different expressions. I see how they define the church. Mark Stiles um, came up with this definition. I think it's pretty good. He says this. The church, of God, uh, the church is the God-ordained local assembly of believers who have committed themselves to each other. They gather regularly. They teach the word, celebrate communion and baptism, discipline their members, establish a biblical structure of leadership. They pray and give together. Certainly the church may do more, but it is no less than this. 
again, I would say to you, it's not a bad definition. But again, no spoiler, I think it's an incomplete definition. So how would the Bible define what a church is? Well, Paul does in 1 Corinthians. Oh, by the way, I can't wait to do 1 Corinthians with you guys. We're starting that in two weeks. It's going to be, oh, buckle up. It's going to be a good series. Anyways, so 1 Corinthians, Paul says this. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. In verse 7. Um, now to each the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So when Paul is trying to define this thing to the church in Corinth, and uh, we'll do the whole background for the church in Corinth, and you'll really understand why Paul kind of keeps coming back to this, is he's trying to say something like, listen, church is a weird thing, right? Often people come to church with expectations. This is what I want. This, you know, it's kind of a menu, right? And again, I understand that. But very rarely... Do people approach church with saying, the Spirit led me here to serve or to act in this way in this local assembly? Very rarely. And by very rarely, I mean, I don't think I've ever had anybody say that to me ever once. Uh, it's just one of those things where we don't really think about. When we think about the church, we don't kind of incorporate the Holy Spirit into it. Um, I like what N.T. Wright, I always like what N.T. Wright says. I never understand most of it. But I love what he says about this part. He says this, the task of the church cannot be attempted without the Spirit. I have sometimes heard Christian people talk as though having done what he's done in Jesus, God now wants us to do our part by getting on with things under our own steam. But that is a tragic misunderstanding and leads either to arrogance or to burnout or both. Without God's spirit, there is nothing we can do that will count for God's kingdom. Without God's spirit, the church simply can't be the church. And I, and I think NT kind of gets that, right? And remember, Dr. Wright is coming from an Anglican church background. But what he is really emphasizing here is, is when you think about the definition of a church, whatever a church is, however you understand a church, if you don't incorporate what the Holy Spirit is doing in that body of believers, I would say to you that your definition is, is kind of, it, it's, it's missing the, the secret ingredient, as McDonald's would say. So if you believe Christianity is only decision, then you will choose one to never grow. If you believe church is a gathering that takes place Sunday mornings or a building that you go to, then your faith becomes situational. Here's what I mean by situational. I'm going to church to meet with God. I don't know if there's any more tragic statement a Christian can say than that. If you believe Sunday morning for an hour, hour and a half, or three hours of I speak or whatever, however it works, right? But if you think that's when you meet with God, you are not living a biblical Christianity. You're living a completely Western Christianity. And, and again, as we talk about UCC, a biblical Christianity can look very different than a Western Christianity. If you understand that biblical Christianity is immersed in the Holy Spirit, then the growth, failure, and transformation of who and what you are becoming is normalized. See, one of the reasons why Western Christianity kind of gets this wrong is it, we, don't know how to, we don't know how to deal with failure. We don't really know how to deal with falling down. Right? We don't, right? What we do is we say, oh, just pray or have faith or just ask for forgiveness, and that's fine, but it really doesn't address the parts of us that are really, the stuff that we hide from everybody else. Our thought lives, our behaviors, our, our things that we do and no one else is around, the, the voices in our head that kind of judge or, or the cruel things that we can think or say or behave, right? But if you understand what the Holy Spirit's trying to do, then failure is absolutely a part of that, right? And, and, and I think this is such a tragic misunderstanding within Christianity because we all fail. We're, 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 we're in the midst of Christianity right now where public figures, leaders within the Christian church, are failing in, in the most grossest and spectacular ways. And we as a church are left with this like, well, if they can't, you know, if they're living this secret life or they're like, we don't know what to do with that. Like we just don't. So what do we do? We cancel, we, we ignore, we question. And, and again, I understand. But especially when you take a look at how the early church existed, the failures were actually more common than actually successes. But they actually knew what to do with it because it was part of their growth process as a part of their you know, win-fail binary way of thinking. Okay, that was just a preamble. <laughs> I know, right? So 
let me start off with this statement here, and this is where we're going to get controversial. Ignorance and refusal of the Holy Spirit's work can cost you your soul or salvation. Huh? The big guns. All right. Now we're going to have some fun. Right? Uh, we're going to come back to this. But see, one of the things I think about when I think about the Holy Spirit is the, is the church really loves, we, we, we like Jesus, and why not, right? But we center in on Jesus a lot, of course. God the Father, somewhat. But the Holy Spirit, almost non-existent. Remember a couple of weeks ago I said that the Western church are really spirit, Holy Spirit atheists? Not that we deny the divinity of the Holy Spirit, but we act and live as if he doesn't exist. If you've been watching our social media feeds, the question I've asked, uh, been asking is like, without the Holy Spirit, I could not dot, dot, dot. Right? Without the Holy Spirit, what could you not accomplish? For most Christians, that's a, kind of an uncomfortable question because they're like, well, nothing. I could do everything I'd been doing without the Holy Spirit. And that might be the fundamental mistake. Is we are not, we're not swinging from the fences in regards to our faith because we just don't think that we need the Holy Spirit for what we do. So when we, at the end of this teaching, I'll come back to the statement, and you can tell me whether, I've, uh, whether I nailed it or not. Spoiler alert, I did. But uh, the question you're going to ask yourself is, is the work of the Holy Spirit as optional as you think? Is the way of saying about the Holy Spirit, my ignorance or my refusal to use or work by the Holy Spirit, is it as optional as we think it is? And hopefully I will prove by the end of this that, I don't think it is. So let's take a look here at pre-salvation. We're going to look at the process of salvation, which, again, you have to understand, right? So pre-salvation is this idea, and we talked about this already, that the Holy Spirit's first function in the world is to come alongside those who are not disciples of Christ yet, to nudge, to convict, to challenge them into that, into that relationship. And we see this in Scripture throughout, right? Um, what is the thing that Jesus says? Right? Remember, John chapter 14, 15, and 16 is Jesus high priestly teaching on the Holy Spirit. But one of the things, the ideas, the themes that Jesus comes to can, you know, again and again is one of the things the Spirit does is will reveal sin to the world. And we go, okay, right? Again, back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, I use the NIV version because I like how they phrase it, but it says this. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever. So however you understand the Holy Spirit, his job in the world right now is those who are not Christ followers, he wants to come alongside and he wants to kind of nudge them. So I said it this way. Everyone on the planet throughout history has had the Holy Spirit convicting, challenging, and nudging them towards an authentic discipleship to Christ. This is a choice placed before humanity. Until we surrender, we are in opposition to God's redemptive plan. Now, that seems a little harsh, doesn't it? Because what I'm saying to you basically is, is we have kind of created three categories of people. Whether we call them unsaved or however, you know, whatever vernacular you want to use for that. And then we would say on the other side, there's the saved. But I would say to you that there's this kind of middle category of, of, of Christians that are just like, meh. Little apathetic, little lethargic. Well, ah, I don't know. You know, I'm I'm kind of comfortable. I don't really want to rock the boat. Well, that's kind of the third category. But the Bible doesn't actually give us that. As a matter of fact, consistently throughout Scripture, and and I, I tried to show you as many examples as this is possible, is there's this 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 image, this idea put forward that either you are for God or you are against Him. That there isn't really a middle ground that we get to kind of lay hold for ourselves. Right? And, and, and what I love about this idea as well, too, is it's not based upon socioeconomic status. It's not based upon demographics. So if you're older, you don't get to retire from the church. If you're younger, you don't get to retire from the church or, or not engage in the church. And then, like, there is no age or stage of your life where you get to opt out of whatever God's called you to. And so consistently what we see here is the Bible tells us something very important. is that unless you are really engaged in the kingdom of heaven, you are really actively participating for God or against God. And again, I don't often talk in binaries, but when I do, it's because the Bible's pretty clear on it. Right? And the examples I showed for you there, I, I want to give you not, not, not just Paul, but Jesus, also James, the younger brother of Jesus as well, too. I want to give you a kind of a broad spectrum of this because this is how the Bible really looks at it. That the Bible sees that there is a category that says, okay, this is the enemy, and this is the work that he wants to do, and these are those who participate willingly or unwilling with, with him. But those of us who are children of God, remember how Paul defines us, right? People of the light, kingdom, however you want to define it, well, we're supposed to be different than that. 
So when we talk about this idea of salvation, we have to really understand that the pre-salvation, that the, the Spirit of God is working in the world. So if I said to you right now, think of somebody in your life that's not a Christian that you wish was a Christian. Now, if, if I'm not mistaken, every one of you would have thought about one person or multiple people. And the thing that you can frustrate you the most is probably either your inability to convey God properly to them, or if they have questions of fearfulness that you're not able to answer, or perhaps that you, you know, you weren't living or behaving in the way, like you maybe had a bad day, you, you did, whatever happens. You, like, we live in this fear of like, oh, I don't know if I'm a good representative of Jesus. Let me just alleviate your worry. You're not. <laughs> it's just, you're not. Because whoever Christ is, the distance between him and who we are is vast. But this is where we don't, this is, the, this is where the, un, the misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit comes in. It's not your job to be perfect. It's not your job to have all the answers to all the questions. I, like, I get to have conversations with people on my milk route and other places in the lobby in the morning, apparently, uh, with people who have different questions about faith. And I read a lot, and I, and I, I get that chance. So I, I get to kind of answer them. But I get people saying to me, Pastor, someone asked me this, or Pastor, this, you know, this happened. You know, what should I respond? And I'm always happy to, as much as possible, give guidance as much as I'm able to, because I don't know everything either. But the problem is, is oftentimes we shy away because we just think, well, I, I just don't know. But if you have in your mind that you realize that the Holy Spirit wants that individual infinitely more than you do to become a Christ follower, then perhaps you're going about this idea of salvation for them in the wrong way. Huh? Okay, so l let me go on here. Uh, I'm not going to unpack any more of that because that's next week. Okay, so process of salvation. There's two parts of salvation, I would say to you. Here, let me tell you about part one, right? And so part one is kind of easy, right? But when we understand the salvation, and we've talked about this at UCC a lot, is that when we think about salvation, the way the Western church has talked about salvation is the sinner's prayer, right? You've all, if you've been in church for any period of time, you've heard the phrase, the sinner's prayer. Like, like, and so what'll, what, what will happen is the pastor will say, and anybody wants to say the sinner's prayer with me, right? And then churches will do something that I think is kind of unwise. Is that if, say, for example, in a church service, 30 people said the sinner's prayer. Well, they'll tweet that out or they'll post that. We had 30 salvations today. And again, I understand the, the excitement, but it's a fundamental misunderstanding that it's not so much the salvation that's important, it's the road to discipleship that happens after that. See, salvation isn't just a confession. As I said to you with Paul, right, in, in Romans chapter 9 there, it's not just about confessing with your mouth, because you can confess with your mouth, but you can live a life that just doesn't reflect that confession. And that's where the Spirit comes into it. So when Paul talks about this idea of salvation, he always kind of emphasizes this idea of the Holy Spirit being deposited in you. And the reason why he emphasizes that is because Paul realizes what perhaps we have forgotten is that without the Holy Spirit living in us, there's no way you're going to overcome any of the stuff, that you, the junk in your lives that you want to kind of deal with, right? Yes, you've got junk in your trunk, and you have lost the funk. I don't know where I'm going with this. I feel like Michael Scott. I started a sentence, I don't know where it's going at the end there, right? You have stuff in your life that you don't want to talk about, you don't want to deal with. There are things in your life that shame you, whether in your thought life, whether in your internet life, whether in your relational life, whatever it might be. But see, the thing is, though, is you try to overcome that stuff with willpower, with this, with whatever. But the thing is, though, doesn't it feel empty and hollow after a while? Because then what happens is you may fall or fail again. And you had such an emotional experience about, you know, how you're never going to do this again or how you're never going to experience that. Never and then it's like, well, I did it again. And then what do you do with that? Right? What do you do with that? So when Paul does it, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, 
And he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And, you be- and when you believed in Christ, he identified you as, as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee, and some of your t- translations will use the word deposit, that, that he will give us the inheritance he promised that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would uh, praise and glorify him. Okay, so we, got, we get that, right? When you become a Christ follower, you have the Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit as a first installment. But now, let me explain something to you. What we need to understand about that deposit of the Holy Spirit, that that is not all of the Holy Spirit that he wants to give to you. Right? So when we surrender to Christ, accept his kingship, and become a true disciple, we receive the first installment of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of words there, and I chose them intentionally, right? But really, remember I said to you that the best idea that I can give to you for salvation isn't so much a confession as it is a surrender. Like, the, the, the way salvation makes the most sense to me is when I come to Jesus and I say, Lord, I give up. I just give up. I've made a mess of my life. My decisions have led me in places I didn't want to be. I, I don't know how, I, like, I just give up. So that idea of surrender, taking up your cross, dying to yourself, right? That's the way I understand salvation the most. But now here's what you need to understand about the Holy Spirit. It's just because God gives you the Holy Spirit at that point or whatever that is, you need to understand that that's not all the Holy Spirit he wants to give to you. And so the image I want you to think about is a mortgage. So right now, with inflation and all that, everyone's talking about mortgages and, and, the, and, the, and the prime rate. And for those of you who don't have houses, guess what? It doesn't matter to you. The only thing that matters to you is I'll never afford a house in my entire lives. Or you look at your parents waiting for them to die. I don't know, right? Like, I actually have now hired a taste tester to test my food. My, my daughters never make me anything to eat just in case because that's, I'm just a dollar sign to them now. That's all I am. But I want you to understand the Holy Spirit like a mortgage. So when I say to you that I own a house, that's actually a bit of a lie. Not that I'm squatting in that house, but I actually don't own the house. I own whatever percentage of it I've paid off. So 17, 20, 23 percent, 30 percent, right? That's all I own. Because you know who else owns the rest of the house? The Bank of Nova Scotia. Yes, that's who I bank with, okay? Not an endorsement, just so you know, right? But they own the rest of it. And every month, I pay a mortgage payment, and it seems like nothing happens, right? But at the end of the five years, according to what they tell me, this is how much I have paid down, and this is how much of the house I own. Well, I want you to think of your life like that as well, too. Imagine the Holy Spirit like a mortgage. God places 10% down on us, which seems like a generous amount these days, right, for the rest of our lives, and continues to deposit the Holy Spirit in us till upon our death we are fully purchased by him. The reason I want you to think about that is I want you to think about Christianity as a process, as a momentum of transformation. So just because you received the Holy Spirit when you first became saved, and again, whatever that looks like for you, please understand that the Spirit's not done with you. Look at the, uh, day one, we get the Holy Spirit. Day two, till death, the Spirit wants to get the rest of us. See, just because you became a Christ follower, this doesn't mean there's not stuff in your life they're not dealing with. Habits trauma from your past, pain, suffering, hurt, hurt by others, family, all this stuff is all goes into your life. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, he's like a house inspector. He's looking at your foundations. He's looking at your roof. He's looking at all this. He's looking at your plumbing, maybe. I don't know. Um, and he's going, okay, we got a lot of work to do. And on the first day he moves in, but for the rest of your life, he is working on the parts of you that you just like to ignore. Right? Um, and, and, and so what's interesting about this is that when John, again, in 1 John, and God has given us a spirit as proof that we live in him and he lives in us. So proof of purchase is the spirit's deposit. But again, as I want to say to you, and I'm not going to keep hammering home, whatever you get in the Holy Spirit when you first become saved is not all the spirit wants to do in your life. Okay? So now let's go to part two of salvation. Right? So that's the first part where we, we accept. We decide we surrender to God. We go, okay. But see, that's not the full story of salvation. The Bible tells us quite clearly that there's this process of 
of salvation called sanctification. That's the theological term. But sanctification simply means to make holy, to purify the process of transformation. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. And as for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. We are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation. Okay, we're there, right? A salvation that came through who? The Spirit. What? Who makes you holy, the word sanctify, and through your belief in the truth. So what Paul is saying to the church in Thessalonica is, yes, when you became saved, you got the Holy Spirit. But now the Holy Spirit's looking in your life and going, okay, we got a lot of work to do. Right? We got a lot of work to do. And that work is going to take the rest of your lives. And sometimes it's going to go fast. And sometimes it's going to go agonizingly slow. But if you understand the work of the Holy Spirit, it's never going to stop. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The beautiful thing about that word veil is, is if Paul is really relying upon Old Testament uh, tabernacle imagery, right? Of the veil being torn in two, what happens to Christ upon the cross, is taken away. For the Lord is a spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Pause there. Pentecostals love this verse. Remember I've told you I'm a recovering Pentecostal, right? So Pentecostals love this verse. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom to... What? That was the funny thing. I always ask, what's the freedom for? I, I can't go to dances. I can't drink. I can't, I can't do drugs. I can't, I can't have sex. I can't, I can't, like, all these things. And again, I'm just being honest with you, right? When we talk about this idea of freedom, I was never quite sure what the freedom was for. Because if the freedom was to go to church, well, I, my mom makes me do that. <laughs> and I don't have a choice. So I don't feel very free, right? Again, that's, my mom was old school, right? No school like the old school, right? So my mom was old school. So I was never quite sure. So what I was told was the freedom to kind of go crazy in worship, which, again, doesn't feel like kind of crazy, right? But it's like, you know, ecstaticness and what could happen and, rah, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's what you get the freedom for. But I never read the rest of the passage. <laughs> no one ever said to me, hey, just read the rest of the Bible because it tells you what the freedom is for. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. See, the freedom that Paul is talking about in this passage is the freedom from ourselves. See, the freedom from our sins, our prejudices, our hatred, our, 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 our brokenness. See, without the Holy Spirit in your life, you are a victim of of you. So how do I have freedom in Christ? Is the spirit is inside of me. He's revealing to me the places and parts of me that need to be brought to the lordship of Jesus. So that's the freedom that Paul's talking about. So that's the transformation. I came across this book by a guy named uh, David Powelson, and the title of the book is called How Does Sanctification Work? And he gives, he gives five steps. I kind of like it because this, this is what he, he kind of reveals. He says, these are the five ways that you are transformed. So he says the first one is God. I like that he starts there. That's good, right? So salvation and whatever you think about it comes from God. Okay, we get to go, yeah, I get that. But the second thing I like is that this idea of truth. And he defines it as this sanctification, the process of holiness is only effective if, not of, sorry, if you focus on biblical world, on a biblical worldview. So what's interesting is, is what he says, is that before you become transformed, you have to have the proper worldview or this idea of the truth. See, what's interesting is that we can come to Christ and we can have all sorts of opinions and ideas. Some are good, some are bad, and some are stupid. The good thing about it, the good, the bad, the stupid. That's a great sermon title. Someone write that down. Someone, someone, that'd be good for later on. But the point simply is, as Christ followers, as we start studying the Bible, right, our, our, our test of what is true, we get to see, oh, this is what I used to think to be true, but this is what God says is true. So now I'm forced to have the struggle between the two. The third thing he says is this idea, he, he uses the phrase, wise people. God mediates our change through the gifts and graces of brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, what I love about this is that what he's really revealing is what Paul understands as well, too, in 1 Corinthians 12, is the body of Christ is also a way that we sanctify one another, is, what, is how we transform each other if we do it properly, right? If we do it properly. One of the reasons why UCC is what we are and how we kind of operate is we actually believe in small churches, and the reason we believe in small churches is because we want our relationships to be front and center in regards to the rubbing together. Ooh, that sounds weird. Um, the, the, the iron sharpening iron, how's that one? Please don't rub, 
anything <laughs> at all. Just, just, okay. Um, iron sharpening iron, right, where we get to kind of sharpen one another. That's what, the, I can't believe we're <laughs> together. That's so bad. By the way, if you're visiting with us, thanks for coming, and we'll never see you again. So thanks so much. That's, that's good to have you. But the point is, if, if the body of Christ functions as it's supposed to, each one of you are meant to help the other move towards Christ. Okay. The, the fourth thing, and this is what I like, because this is the part that a lot of people don't get. Suffering and struggle. And that's what he says. People change because something is hard, not because it goes well. Struggles force us to need God. Remember I told you, what do we do with failure? Failure is just a, a way of showing you that you're not as far along as you think you are. And that failure is going to help you to realize that you just need God. Do you know, the times in our lives that we are closest to God are the times in our lives our lives have fallen apart the most. That's just, that's just how it goes, right? Whether it's tragedy, whether it's, it's, it's suffering, whether it's our own choices that we've made, when our lives are falling apart, we are confronted with the reality that control is an illusion. We do not control our lives. We do not control the outcomes of our lives. And so in that moment, we go, okay, God, I need you. God's like, you always did. You just didn't realize it. So I love the fact that this is number four. But now look at this now, number five. See, we think of transformation. If I become saved, then transformation. What I like about his way of looking at it is transformation is the last step in this process. Realize the, 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 realize the steps that precede this one. So rather than saying, okay, I became a Christ follower and now I'm going to become changed and all the things I struggle, wrestle with and, 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 and work against are now all gone. As if. Right? As if. So he says, transformation happens when these five take place in your life. And I kind of go, yeah, I like that. Um, so here we go. Here's where the controversy happens. There's two classifications of the work of the Holy Spirit in the believers called fruits and, 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 and gifts. So much of the conversation on, on the fruit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit seem to be optional. So if I said to you, what is the, what, what, what's your gift of the Spirit? It's kind of a funny one when you think about it. Because I think most of you would be like, well, just by looking at some of your faces, by the way, I'm not going to ask you to answer this question, right? But most of you, when I said this, were like, you know, it's funny how much body language gives us away. I, I can always tell with the statements I make, people are like, well, when I look for the, t the, the head tilt, or I, people kind of sh uh, sink back in their seats like, please don't look at me, please don't look at me, don't make eye contact. Um, if I said to you, what's your gift of the Spirit? What would your answer be? If I said to you, what's, what's your fruit? What fruit have you have in the Spirit? What would your answer be? See, oftentimes we think of this topic as optional. Oh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of mango-like. I, I look like a mango. I'm round, so maybe I'm mango. That's my fruit, right? Or maybe I'm a grape or well, I don't know, like whatever the fruit might be, right? It's like we don't really have an answer, do we? Right? We don't really have an answer to this. So much of the conversation of the fruit and gifts of the Holy Spirit seem to be optional, as if they will appear by magic and that, it's not, and that we are not in control of the process of transformation. So if I said to you, what are your gifts? What are your, what are your fruit? Oftentimes people will go, well, I don't know. Or people will say, well, whatever, you know, whatever happens. And we have this idea of kind of abdicating our responsibility in this process. But if you look at the Bible, that's not how the Bible actually describes it. So let's take a look here at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 25. This is a famous passage on the fruit of the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Some of you are singing the song in your heads about this, how you'd remember this, right? There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nation, of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. You know this passage. I don't, I, I, like, I'm not sharing any like, kind of revelatory with you. The thing I'm going to share with you is the word that Paul uses for fruit. Because it's an actual, it's a word that's used quite a bit, but oftentimes it's used by Jesus. And so when Paul's talking to the church in Galatia, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And, and forget, by the way, forget the categories. Because really it doesn't, it's not as important as what Paul is trying to say. Because if you look at these ones, you go, okay, these are the fruit of the Spirit. I would say to you that there could be more fruit of the Spirit. 
because Paul's not making a definitive list, because Paul talks about the Spirit in other terms and doesn't, doesn't replicate lists, and I'll show you that in a second. So what has Paul tried to convey to the church in Galatia? Well, it actually comes from the word fruit. I know, kind of weird, right? So the Greek word that Paul uses is a Greek word called karpos. In the New Testament, the Greek word karpos comes up several times. Sometimes it's translated as crop and others as fruit. In this particular one, Paul uses the word karpos for fruit. Now, the person who uses this word the most in the New Testament is Jesus. If you look a lot of the parables of how Jesus talks about, he talks about uh, this idea of fruit or harvest, right? So in Mark chapter 4, verse 20, and the seed that fell in the good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest, carpos, of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much has been planted. The parable of the sower. You know the story, right? But again, the same word that, that Paul uses for the fruit of the Spirit, it's carpos, is a, is a word that Paul steals from Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verses 8 and 10. Proof uh, by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Great. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the tree. Yes, every tree that does not produce good carpos, fruit, will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Now, does this seem as if Jesus is making this optional? Does this seem like Jesus is saying, you know what, if you don't have any fruit, it's okay. I don't think so. John chapter 15, verse 5. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce what? Much carpos, fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And by the way, if you read, read a little bit further on there, if you don't produce fruit, you're chopped down, thrown into the fire. Now, I just want to be clear about something. At UCC, I'm not here to tell you how or how you should not live. My, my goal as a pastor, I know, is to, is to present to you, as much as possible, a biblical narrative of what, what the Bible is saying. It's up to you to decide. But what I am trying to show you is when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, we always think about this as kind of a, ah, you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, I, I don't know, right? But I would say because we think of it as so optional, we don't really invest or ask ourselves for a test to see if we're actually living this way. And as Christianity becomes increasingly moved to the fringes of society, we have two options. Either we get angry, and that's seen in social media, where Christians are saying or doing or behaving in ways that really, there's no fruit in that at all. And if there is fruit, it's absolutely rotten. Right? We as Christ followers, we need the fruit more at the fringes than we did at the center. When we were at the center in culture, I would say the 1930s, 1950s, we didn't need much fruit. Why? Because we were the center. But as we are moving now to the fringes of culture, which is where we are right now, we desperately need fruit. You know why? Because people just don't believe what we're saying anymore. If God is love, then why are you so hateful? Why do you hate so many people? Why do you attack so many people? And again, I can't argue with that because there is some validity to that statement. Because why? We think the fruit is optional. And we think the fruit may be, uh, may be, may be needed in everyday life, but digital world doesn't exist. And I would say to you that that is a gross misunderstanding of what Jesus is saying here. Let's, let's continue because Jesus has more to say about this topic. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Huh. Can you pick grapes from a thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Again, do you see what Jesus is saying here? How do you identify true disciples of Jesus? They've got fruit. How do you identify those who are not disciples of Jesus? They have no fruit. Does this feel optional to you? Verse 17, a good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. By the way, same word that Paul uses, carpos. Verse 19 20. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. So one of the things we think about when we think of this idea of fruit is we think of it as optional. Like, oh, I woke up this morning and there's a grape on me. If that happens, please go see your doctor. It might be a goiter. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but we think of ourselves as fruit as being optional. Um, just so you know, this next slide I'm going to show you, I can't remember, when I take my notes, when I do a lot of reading, sometimes I forget to reference. I try never to steal other people's uh, 
thoughts. This is from somebody else, and I can't remember who's. I'm not going to present it as my own, but I like what they have to say. This is what they talk about when they talk about the fruit of the, uh, fruit of the Spirit. It says this, the, fruit, the growth of the fruit is gradual. The growth of the fruit is inevitable. The growth of the fruit is internal. And the growth of the fruit is symmetrical. And here's what they mean. They grow together. So a lot of people say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on the, on the fruit of the spirit of, of love or patience. Have you ever seen a tree just produce one fruit? You know, it's funny. Uh, since I've worked for my farmer, I, I deliver milk. I'm bivocational. I've had a lot of conversations about the Bible and how Jesus uses imagery of farming to describe what the kingdom of heaven is like. And so I work for a dairy farmer. And a dairy farmer has two types of cows. One that produces milk and the other that becomes steak. That's how it works, right? Because he's a dairy farmer, and there's a cow that doesn't produce milk. That cow is not going to get fed anymore. That cow becomes steak, and they are delicious, okay? But the point is simply this, is that the, the cow is supposed to produce milk. That's what they're supposed to do. And, and again, for us, you know, when I first started working there, one time the cows were out in the field, and I was going up to a cow, and, like, and, and the uh, Guernsey cows, uh, by the way, young adults, we're going to have a tour of the farm. I've talked to my farmer. We're going to do, we're going to do that. So uh, we'll do that for the young adults group. But um, the cows are very gentle. Guernsey cows uh, are very gentle. So I, was, uh, I parked my car, and they're just out in the field there. So I walked up, and I was petting one on the nose. My gym, my farmer, uh, walks up. This is when I first started with him. He goes, he goes oh, yeah, that cow is so-and-so. Oh, it's so nice. Yeah, they're being slaughtered today. Oh. <laughs> I felt like chaining myself to the cow. Like, no, don't take the cow's light, right? But the point simply is, is the, the farmer knows that either you produce or you don't. But the thing with Jesus is he has the same idea. And I just want you to know, all the verses that I've showed you are from the cute, cuddly Jesus. All right? See, Paul gets the, kind of the, the, the idea that he's the, really the tough one or whatever, right? But Jesus says, either, either you produce or you don't. You produce, you show that you're Jesus' disciple. You don't, you show that you're kind of you're, you might be lying to yourself. Gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses eight to, uh, verse 1 and 8 to 10. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. But that's not the only gift list. Another one's in Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things as well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If your gift is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift for showing a kindness to others, do it gladly. Now, what's important you need to understand with the gifts list, there's three gifts lists. I'm only going to show you two of them because the third one bugs me a little bit because it's the, it's, it's the list that says, now in the past God gave apostles, prophets, teachers. I don't think that is a gift list. Uh, I don't really want to unpack that now, but I don't think that... Whenever I pause, just so that's when my filter kicks in, I don't believe the uh, offices of these uh, po apostle, prophet, p uh, teacher, blah, blah, blah. I don't think they exist anymore. And there's a whole reason for that. But the first one is that Paul uses it in the past tense as opposed to the future tense. But anyways, that's a different story. Now, what you need to understand about the spiritual gifts are the gifts are need-oriented. You get the gift of encouragement. Why? Because someone is down. You get the gift of healing. Why? Because somebody is sick. You get Again, the gifts are need-oriented. They manifest when encountered by two parts, a willing participant, straw, and a need the Holy Spirit wants to meet. So you need to understand something about the Holy Spirit. That's why I try to get you away from the battery image of the Holy Spirit. You can pray for healing, you can pray for all these things, but you do not know the will of the Spirit. Anytime in my life as a pastor, when I've prayed over somebody and I feel like God's given me a word, or, or, or we're praying for healing, I always say this at the very beginning. I don't know if this means anything to you, and I'm not sure if this is from the Spirit, but I feel like, and then I'll say whatever I need to say. The reason I do so is just to say that I don't speak for God. And I could perhaps want to share something with you, but I could be wrong. 
but I always want to put that in there. And if it's God, usually they start crying, and I'm like, okay, good, I hit that one hundred dollars, right? Or oftentimes, if they start doing this, hmm, I'm like, oh man, I messed that up totally, right? It's just a tell. It's just how it was, right? When healing, it's really easy because um, they either healed or not. <laughs> I, I don't think I think I've shared this story before of, of one of my first encounters of healing. When I was in Bible college, I think it's second year, uh, we have something called spiritual emphasis days. It's the dumbest name ever for Bible college students, I know. But the idea behind it is that it's quiet time, right? And so we have we 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 cancel classes for the week. And basically, what we do is we just have we have spir- we have services throughout the week. You know, we have speakers in, and that's what we do. Great. But of course, because we're Pentecostals, we have really loud worship. As a matter of fact, when I walked into the auditorium, they had a full stack of speakers on either side of the thing there. And I thought to myself, oh, that's bad news, because that's going to be really loud. Well, sure enough, there was a service going on, and of course, they had an altar call time. Pentecostals love the altar time, right? I, of course, uh, I like altar time too, but I actually had to go upstairs and put, put signs up on the, in the dorm saying, quiet time, right? So I'm there, I'm putting, this, I'm putting up these posters, and I'm just trying to be honest with you with what took place. And I see in the, f- in the middle of the, the foyer in the, in, the, in the dorm, this guy named Phil. And he has his hand like this. And he's, he's kind of rocking back and forth, and I could tell his face was in pain. I'm putting up posters uh, all in the dorm with masking tape, and I see him, and I'm an RA, so I know that I'm supposed to be spiritual. And I know I'm supposed to go over and say, hey, Phil, what's wrong? I don't want to, just to be clear, because I got to get the posters up, and I want to go for ramen. I just, I just, just, I love ramen, okay? But of course, my conscience gets the best of me, so I walk over to Phil. I say, hey, Phil, what's wrong, buddy? He goes, well, I was downstairs, and I was in front of the speaker. And of course, feedback comes through, and he's right by the speaker. And I don't know what happened, uh, but either his eardrum burst or something, but there's liquid going down his ear. I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV, but I know that's bad. When someone starts crying from the ear, that's not a good thing. I said, hey, Phil, do you want me to call him an ambulance? Because that's my level of faith. He said, maybe, but can you pray for me first? <sighs> Fine, Phil, I'll pray for you. I'm just trying to be honest with you because I, like, I had zero faith. I didn't, have a, Let's say, I didn't speak in King James. I put my hand on Phil's ear. I said, dear, dear Jesus, Please heal Phil in your name, amen. That's it. That's all I could muster. And I go. I said, after I pray, hey, Phil, you want to uh, get an ambulance? He's like, no, okay, fine. I done my work. <laughs> as far as liability goes, I'm covered, okay? Phil walks down the hall about a minute later, and he's like, I'm like, Phil, is the ambulance here? Are you going to the hospital? He's like, no, I can hear from my ear again. I, you know what my first response was? Shut up. <laughs> I'm like, really? I was as surprised as anybody. Now, let me just say something to you. I'm in straw. I was a really bad straw, okay? I was a very thin straw. I was like a like the coffee stir stick straws, okay? <laughs> like that's how bad of a straw I was at this moment. But what I, don't, I didn't realize, because I didn't have a fully formed understanding of the Holy Spirit, is for some reason the Spirit wanted to, 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 to heal Phil. And I'm the most unreluctant, unre- uh, unfaithful human being at that moment at the time. That was there. But I was willing. So Phil goes down and he shares his testimony. By the way, he doesn't give me any credit, which, I, you, know, I, you know, that's fine too. But uh, I'm teasing. But the point simply is, is, and the reason I say this to you, is because I need to understand something. I didn't think God was going to heal Phil. I certainly didn't approach it like I thought God was going to heal Phil. And this has happened to me several times, not all the time. I don't have a healing ministry. I don't own a white suit, although I could rock one. Um, but it's happened to me several times, and I'm always surprised. But I always pray to people. Whenever I pray for whatever I pray for, I always say, Lord, in your will. Because I don't know God's will. I, I don't. And so I just precursor that so that I don't own whatever takes place. Now, when it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, here's the controversial part. Remember I asked you what your gift of the Spirit was, and wisely none of you said anything. Not that you would, but here's the thing that's kind of bugs me about this topic. Don't raise your hand, I'm about to say. How many of you have taken a gifts test? Don't raise your hand. I would say if, I, if, if studies are, are accurate, I'd say about half of you at some point in time have taken a spiritual gifts test. 
You cannot take a test to determine your spiritual gifts. These tests determine affinities, interests, and not the working of the Holy Spirit. See, whenever I've taken the uh, spiritual gifts test, I get, guess what? Teaching. Great. But that's not my gift. I work a lot. Uh, I work really hard to put my sermons together. I told you last week between 25 to 30 hours per research for a sermon. If that's a gift, that's a really bad gift. I should just be able to get up here and go, I got it all taken care of, right? Because it's a gift. But see, if I ask you about your spiritual gift, what I'm really asking about is what has God done in your life in the past? How has God used you to meet a need? But the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is how he's worked in the past in you will not mean how he work in the future with you. In my life, on one occasion, I've interpreted somebody's dream. I have never interpreted a dream ever again. Please do not send me, send me any emails of you on a unicorn riding a sailboat with, I don't know, whatever. Like, I don't know what that means, okay? One time, someone said to me, I've had this bad dream. It's, it's happening over and over. And they told me the dream. And then they told me the dream. It's like the Spirit said, this is what it means. So I said, I don't know if this is what it means. This is what the Spirit said to me. And I said to them, they start crying. Okay, I nailed it. Great. <laughs> but just to be clear, I've never done that ever again in my entire life. Because guess what? The Spirit said to me, but I could have not said anything. Why? My gift test telling me I'm a teacher. I'm not an interpreter of dreams, thankfully. But the point is, whatever the Spirit's done in you, it's not mean what he's going to do with you in the future. And especially if you think about it this way. If you are growing in Christ, what you were in the beginning is not what you are in the middle, and it's not what you are towards maturity. So God will bring people to you, through you, in, in circumstances that he'll want to work in you. And so the gift lists do not align. I could show you the three gift lists in the, in the New Testament, and, and they're not the same. If Paul was trying to be definitive, and Paul is very careful about his words, all the gifts list would be the same. But the reason they don't align is because Paul is not trying to, trying to quantify this is the only way the Spirit works. Do you know, I really think that there is a spiritual gift of digital evangelism. I don't think many people have it. But I think I've seen some people who do. Like the Bible Project on YouTube, I think there is definitely a Holy Spirit divine gift there because what that, that organization, what those two guys started and have done has been incredible. How they've brought knowledge and understanding to the church about the Bible and about really complex ideas, I think it's beautiful. I think they have a spiritual gift of digital interpretation. I know. It doesn't show up in, in, in Paul's gifts list, but that's, it doesn't have to. I think many of you students here you have spiritual gifts and you're in your class and you're interacting with, with people. I think God wants you to use you in certain ways, but I think you resist because you just don't think you're worthy of it or you're, you're just equipped for it. And I think you're robbing those around you and of the spirit what he wants to do in you. So when we talk about this idea of, 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 the, um, of the gifts list, we need to understand something that these are not meant to be. Just a couple of examples. Uh, Henry and Mel Blackaby. What's so spiritual about your, your gifts? Look what he says. It can help identify how God has used you since you've become a Christian, but it shouldn't be used as a guide for how God desires to use you in the future. For God's purposes are based upon his strengths, not yours alone. He may choose to take you into areas of service in which you are naturally weak to reveal his strength and bring glory to himself. Understand something. If, if the spiritual gifts were based upon how good you are at something, they're not spiritual gifts. You see what I'm saying? You cannot take a test to tell how the Spirit wants to work in you because these tests are not going to quantify what the Spirit will do with you in the future. There's another one, uh, Kathy Howard. She's fantastic website on this stuff. She says, at their best, spiritual gifts tests may identify spiritual gifts and natural talents and abilities. But at their worst, since they cannot distinguish between them, the test can actually encourage believers to serve according to their natural talents rather than relying on the power and equipping of the Holy Spirit. See, one of the things I, I have, one of, my, one of my natural talents is I like to serve people. It's weird, I know. I just like serving people. I don't know why. I just do. I enjoy having people over. I love, I love doing, like, like, I like serving people. But it's not a spiritual thing because I just, I like doing it. But you know what I don't like doing? 
I don't like apologizing when I've done something wrong. You know what I don't like doing? I don't like delivering milk two days a week because I have other things I need to do in my time. Yeah, and again, I could just go on the whole list of things I don't like to do. But it's the things that I don't like to do, the Spirit really wants to use me. Because it's where I resist the Spirit, that's when I know the Spirit really wants to do something. Think to yourself a thing that you want, don't like to do the most in regards to your Christian life. And I'm saying to you right now, your dislike of that is an indicator of what the Spirit's trying to release in your life. The more we resist, the less we will be used by Him. So let me just kind of sum it up this way with this diagram. Fruit of the Spirit, gift of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is internal change. Gift of the Spirit is outward working of that. But the important thing to remember is that all of these lead towards transformation into Jesus. Okay? The most spirit-filled people resemble Jesus. Not that they speak in tongues. Not that they raise their hands in worship. Not that they, like, it doesn't matter whatever you think about when you think about what the spirit-filled looks like. If you were to ask me when I was 15, what does a spirit-filled person look like? I would say to you, they speak in tongues. A, I didn't speak in tongues when I was 15. That came later in my life. But that's what I thought. That was the ultimate, that was the pinnacle of spirituality in my, life, in my mind was, was speaking in tongues. You know what I didn't think of? is a person who's cleaning up after everybody else leaves. The, the sound team that comes at like 7.30, quarter 8 in the morning when no one else is here yet. Or stay here till 12, 12, 15, cleaning up after you all leave. See, when we talk about this idea of what a spirit-filled person looks like, it's just Jesus. Remember I've said to you, there are so many Christians who don't resemble Jesus, and I modify that to say there are Christians who are just lacking the spirit in their lives. Okay, almost done. Let's come back to this. Ignorance and refusal of the Holy Spirit's work can cost you your soul, your salvation. The fruit of the Spirit, as, as, as Paul says it, karpos, is the exact same word that Jesus uses as an identification marker for his disciples. I hope that as we've gotten to this end part here, that you realize this is not optional, people. The work of the Spirit in your life is not optional. And the greatest trick the enemy has done upon the Western church is made it optional. One of the reasons why the church today in postmodern culture is so ineffective is we are using cultural methodologies to try to change the culture. And I'll say to you right now, these do not work anymore. I don't care how great the production value of the worship is, how beautiful the singers are, how great the, the music is, how beautiful the buildings are. I don't care about any of that stuff. You know why? It's not making disciples of Jesus. It's keeping people culturally Christians, but it's not transforming people. Nothing's wrong with it, but churches more and more are emphasizing that. I went to a, a pastor's conference uh, a number of years ago, and the speaker said this, Churches, if you don't have a full-time marketing director, you will not impact the world for the kingdom. And do you know what happened there? This is a, this is a small conference of 17,000 people where guys like Andy Stanley and Francis Chan and Wren Collective and like all the biggest names you can think of in Christianity. Right? They're all like, yeah, oh, we're raw. And I, back then, like, yeah, okay, marketing, okay, fine. Nothing wrong with that. Sure, we could have, you know, our Instagram, whatever. That's fine. But honestly, if it's not the Holy Spirit, it's not going to transform. We are not going to make an impact to this world if we are relying upon methodologies that the enemy does a thousand times better than the church. It's just not going to work. I would say to you, we just need to get spooky again. Do you know what's interesting to me? People don't really want to talk about God or church or the Bible, but they do want to talk about the supernatural. I had one guy, this is one receiver at Sobeys. I'm not going to say which one. Every time I come, he's got a new question. So you're a Christian, right? He knows I'm a pastor. I always tell people that. It always freaks him out at some point in time. The question he asks, so what about ghosts? I'm like, piece of cake. Here we go. We'll have a, like a 30-minute conversation. Trucks are backed up trying to get into the loading dock. But he's asking me about ghosts. A lot of his questions are all about the spooky, creepy, kind of weird old stuff that's going out there. I have no problem having this conversation because I have a biblical worldview of the unseen realm. Let's talk about ghosts. 
But see, he's interested in this stuff. He, he's just fascinated about this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? The Bible answers this question better than any other document. I actually gave him a Bible eight months ago. I said to him, hey, a lot of these questions are in here. Well, I don't want to read it. I'll tell you what to read, bozo. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what to read. I'll, I'll give it to you and read. So he asked me questions, and that, that's cool. But I just, I just I need you to understand something. I don't say this because, again, you guys, if you guys have been with us for any part of time, you know how I, my heart is. I'm not, a, I'm not a manipulator. I don't want to manipulate you. I don't want to uh, guilt you. We don't use guilt and manipulation here at UCC. Those tools never seem to work. But I do want you to understand the severity that Christ says it. This stuff's not optional. This stuff's not optional. And if you want to be effective with your friends, your family, your coworkers, your entire life, you've got to bring it back into the realm of the Spirit. Because that's where transformation takes place. Let me close. John chapter 16, verse 13 to 15. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me and all that belongs to the Father is mine. And that is why he said, the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. The word there I emphasize is glory. Now, we've talked about this word glory, but the glory simply means weight or reverence or, or strength. Our Christianity isn't bringing Jesus glory. It's bringing speakers, writers, authors, musicians glory. It's bringing buildings Methodology glory. But you know what brings glory to God? Weak. Weakness. Humble. This is what brings God's, God's glory. Because whatever God accomplishes, it's like only God could do that. Right? It's only God can do that. This is one of the reasons why at UCC we don't do a lot of big events. We don't bring big speakers in. We don't do, you know, <clears throat> all this stuff. It's fine. It's, and, and again, I'm not, please hear me very clearly. You can do this. It costs lots of money and it takes lots of volunteer time and it ultimately doesn't change people's lives. I've seen the data and I can show it to you. Right? People come. They attend. I used to do, uh, at, at, a, at our previous church somewhere in the world, we used to do young adult lunches. Just so you know, young adults are moochers. You do a university lunch, you will get hundreds of young adults to show up. And we fed them well. But I had a young adults program that happened Sunday night we were getting 15 to 17 people. But see, the thing is, though, is that on, on Facebook and Instagram, the church would tweet out, we had 200 students. We fed 200 students, uh, you know, at our church. <clears throat> Guess what? Who cares? Who cares, right? I, I, if I said to you right now, next week, we're going to have food trucks lined up all across the street, and we're going to pay for everybody for university students. Guess what? The place would be packed. And we would tweet it out and go, oh, UCC is doing such a great job reaching people for Christ. No, we're not. We're just feeding people. Yes, Siri. We're just feeding people. That's all we're doing. The only reason my young adults group went from what it was to what it was is when we got off campus from the church. It went downtown to the scuzziest bar you could ever imagine. Like, I mean, sticky floor kind of scuzzy. And then we went from 17 people to 160 and that's not a yay pass. Like, I honestly, I thought the whole thing was going to fail. I really did. But again, when you allow God to do what he does, he, f he fills in the gaps that you can't, and he, then he transforms people. There's a few of you here in this, this, this room, and if this is meaning to anybody, that's fine too. But you know God's calling you to something. And you're resisting because it doesn't make sense. you got a trajectory planned in your life, and it just doesn't make sense. And God's like trying to nudge you to something. Whoever you are, you can continue your trajectory. It's a safe one. It's a logical one. But it's not what the Spirit wants from you. I don't know who you are, and I'm not going to ask for hands. Matter of fact, I don't want to know. I just want you to know the Spirit knows. See, the church has got to be spookier because it, its original foundations was supernatural. And I'm telling you right now, the world is desperate for people to talk about the supernatural, and Christians don't do it anymore. We talk about behavior modification. We talk about all this kind of stuff. But the people want to talk about this. Why? That's how we're created. 
we want to bring glory to Jesus, only weak and humble people can bring glory to Jesus. Confident, affluent, you know, powerful people, they bring glory to themselves. Confident, affluent, powerful churches bring glory to themselves. Weak and humble, that brings glory. Gifts and fruits, you guys have them. You just don't know it or you're resisting. And if you're resisting, just reference the verses on the fruit of the Spirit. Because again, I'd say to you right now, it's not optional as Jesus explains it. Let's pray. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Sorry. Hashtag not sorry about going a little bit longer. I just want you to think, to meditate, to reflect upon it. That's why we do what we do right now. No one looking around. Just give you this opportunity to let the Spirit speak to you. We can fool ourselves into thinking that the fruits and gifts of the Spirit will happen whenever the Spirit wants. I would say to you that you just need to turn that equation around. The Spirit's desperate for these things to happen, but we just need to be willing. I think the Spirit is looking for Christ followers, disciples of Jesus, to bear fruit, to be operating in the gifts. But that takes a willingness, that takes a humility, and that kind of takes a little bit of a bravery as well too. You are supernatural beings. You are flesh-covered souls. Your bodies will give away at some point in time, but the Spirit that God's placed in you is eternal. His spirit wants to partner with your spirit to do abundantly more than you can hope or imagine. Stop saying no. Stop saying not me. Stop saying I'm not. Just start saying yes, Jesus. Yes, spirit. Baby steps first, of course. But in boldness and strength, strength of Jesus, strength of the spirit, start seeing what God wants to do in you. Holy Spirit, we are so grateful for your strength and your power in our lives. I ask and I beg of you, Spirit of the Most High God, the creative force of the universe, to speak to the hearts and minds of those here or online or at a later date. Holy Spirit, first and foremost, we apologize for not partnering with you for Christ's kingdom. We apologize for not taking seriously the fact that you want to work in and through and despite us in the world today. Holy Spirit, we ask, we beg, we plead with you to fill us to overflowing once again in Jesus' name. That you would make us like Jesus in a world that is desperately looking for authentic Christ-like disciples. Holy Spirit, please fill us. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to know, and a heart to understand. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.